It's now my pleasure to introduce Juno Diaz. Mr. Diaz was born in Santo Domingo and raised in New Jersey. A graduate of Rutgers College, he is the author of Drown and the Brief Wondrous Life of Oscar Wow, which won the John Sargent Senior First Novel Prize, the National Book Critics Circle Award, the Dayton Literary Peace Prize, and the 2008 Pulitzer Prize, among many, many others. His fiction has appeared in The New Yorker, African Voices, Best American Short Stories, and in the Pushcart and O. Henry Prize stories. He is the fiction editor at the Boston Review and Nancy Allen Professor of Creative Writing at MIT. In the linked stories of This Is How You Lose Her, Diaz reintroduces readers to Junior, the narrator who first appeared in Drown. The women who enter and eventually exit Junior's life are the core of these stories, and love in all of its forms, obsessive, illicit, familial, and erotic, weaves through each tale as we follow Junior back and forth in time from a beach in the Dominican Republic to his mother's basement in Jersey. NPR calls This Is How You Lose Her engrossing and ambitious, as funny as it is brutal, and as complex as it is candid. I'd like to thank you once again for joining us this evening, and now please join me in welcoming Juno Diaz. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. Thanks, Harvard Books, yeah, for having me. Um, uh, the Brattle Theater um, for hosting us, yeah. I wanted to thank all the folks who made this event possible, a uh, bunch of people who did an enormous amount of work, yeah. It's always the invisible work that makes these gatherings a reality, yeah. I wanted to thank the Boston Review. Um, Boston Review is like, they are the shit, <laughs> you know? They are in our midst and we never notice what amazing work they do till they're gone, yeah? So hopefully they do never leave us, yeah? Um, and I wanted to thank, uh, you know, guys, it's strange because it's, uh, you know, as an artist, you get lucky sometimes, yeah? Really nice things happen to you for the moment. Um, though an artist's career is measured across a span of many, many years. Um, but no matter whether some good stuff is happening to you as an artist, or you're sort of just laboring um, in some corner, um, feeling completely neglected, the reality of it is, is that most of us as artists depend on a tremendous group of people not only to make our art possible, whether it's the damn people who are supporting us while we're in our basement slaving, yeah? Anybody here supporting an artist at all? <laughs> You're not gonna give me hands, nobody? <laughs> yes! We don't, we artists don't give you guys what you deserve, do you, yeah? But you know, whether it's somebody just supporting you at the quotidian level or it's people who get in and swing for you at the critical level, yeah? And there's always this chain, there's always this kind of blessed group of people upon which every artist depends on, no matter where they are in their career. And it's with that in mind that I kind of wanted to thank all the folks who made that possible. My, one of my greatest defenders, and the only reason I have the kind of career I do have is present here. Um, her name is Miho Cha. She was my earliest champion, we're talking about in 1995. And she has been with me since then, and always someone who deeply believed in my work long before anyone had even heard or read anything of mine. She was someone who kept saying, this is really important, you need to keep going. And I got to tell you, uh, with uh, when I think about where I am, when I think about what I have, it's uh, the people like Miho who have made me possible and to whom I owe such a tremendous debt. Yeah, and so I just wanted to take a few minutes uh, to say thank you, Miho Cha. I love you dearly. I wouldn't be here without you. And to the rest, you know, who have supported so valiantly and often anonymously, thank you so much. Um, you know, it ain't like anybody's fucking dying to read about Dominican Jersey people off the bat. <laughs> I mean, off the bat, it's kind of a fucking weird bridge, yeah? <laughs> And that we're here says, often the fact that we're here at this moment says a lot about the enormous hostility this country feels towards Latinos, the enormous hostility this country feels towards immigrants. And kind of, there's always a moment where this country's like, fuck, we gotta elect Obama. 
so we can crush the rest of the community. Yeah? Yeah. It's weird. We'll, we have no problems occasionally, if you fight hard enough, rewarding an individual. But the day we start rewarding communities, and that's the day some of you young people bring to be our utopian future, yeah? So with that said, <laughs> I thought we would do it a little differently. Um, we got a little bit about, about an hour, yeah? And so I thought we would take some questions at the beginning. I would read in the middle, take some questions at the end, and then we would call it a day, yeah? Oh, and fuck, and guys, thank you so much for coming out. <laughs> for real. In my last story, I made comments about Boston being very racist. Guys, I feel like this has got to be a collective answer. <laughs> for real, because it's really my kind of character. I mean, you got to understand, I, I, I definitely am a person who writes explicitly and sort of persistently, consistently about race, yeah? And certainly about white supremacy and the way it kind of works. Um, but this is an answer that I, I'm no expert and because I always want sort of people to ask white artists, like, you never mention race, <laughs> you know, or that. So I get the question, and I think it's legitimate, but I was wondering, what do you guys think? Boston, has, has Boston become less racist or more racist in the last 10 years? Hmm, it depends on who you are. Where, Where too, right? <laughs> and it depends on who you ask. You guys know that Boston has like the lowest rate of retention of black and Latino students who graduate from college of any college town in the country, right? Like the lowest rate. Do you guys remember that Boston Globe front page report about this just like two years ago, I think? So my thing is, is I'm not sure the climate of Boston has changed from my perspective because the country's climate has become starkly anti-Latino in the last 10 years in ways that are difficult to imagine, and Boston is a part of that. Yeah. So, I mean, I'm no fucking expert on race, yo, but I always think that people vote with their feet when students of color start graduating from, you know, all the universities we have here and say, I'm going to stick around, then we might say something has changed. But as it stands, ain't nobody fucking sticking around. I listen to sports radio here all the time. I listen to New York sports radio and I listen to Boston sports radio. The amount of nonsense, racial, racial nonsense that gets said within an hour. I turn it on and in an hour I can sit there with a clicker. <laughs> and every single player of color who's done anything, they're like after them. I'll go to New York and these motherfuckers are like, I will attack everybody. And you can feel it that it's not racialized the way it's here. I guess the thing is, is that it's not about, I feel like this is not about a positional argument about defending or attacking Boston. This is for me, what is Boston emblematic of? And if we're saying that Boston is somehow immune or not representative, then what we're basically saying is there's no racism in this country. So either there is racism in this country and every place has it and expresses it and is representative of it and has particular histories which allow it to be explicit in forms that in other places are not, where it's, we are a utopian fucking race-free society. And we're not, man. And I think part of what, what's going on as far as my work is concerned is that the joke about that is that I have been attacking racism in New Jersey, New York, and the Dominican Republic like crazy through my art. But the place that people have raised most questions about is Boston. <laughs> they don't give a fuck. They're like, oh yeah, fuck it. Yeah, racism in Jersey. But Boston, <laughs> how could this possibly be? Because I think part of what happens in Boston is you can always tell the operations of white supremacy because there's great resistance in identifying its operations. Where in Jersey, motherfuckers will be like, is there racism here? Yep. <laughs> and it shows what a great effort we've made in sort of attacking that kind of racist kind of public discourse and the rhetoric. But I think in Boston, it still cloaks itself. It still protects itself. It's still unwilling to really face reality. There's still at Boston, not everyone clearly, because you don't want to generalize, but the public discourse in Boston is still at this place where I am skeptical that there's racism. That is wild to me. 
that is that to me is absolutely wild that that is the initial step that i am skeptical that's like when you listen to my male students and i'm like talk bring up sexism and all my male students are like i am skeptical Because it seems absurd with gender, but with race, we just tighten up, man. We tighten up. So anyway, I mean, I, I think that I'm glad you asked that question, and I mean, and that you hung tough, too. But, you know, you got to swing, man. But don't you think, and I will leave it here because we want to take a bunch of questions, but don't you guys think what's really happening in Boston and that we sort of pretend isn't that all the universities have picked this town's pocket don't pay what they're supposed to be paying. The students are utterly protected. I'm sorry, if I was a Harvard student and I'm dealing crack, <laughs> for real, for fucking real, I know where I can get fucking drugs from Harvard students and everybody knows, and they're not going after them the way they're going after these kids in Central Square. Isn't what's really happening in Boston is that the universities have absolutely picked the pockets of this town don't pay for anything. Protected students have created this totally by sort of this, this sort of split structure. And what they've left people in town with is this really distorted local nationalism, which is predicated on sports, a suspicion and an anger towards people of color and immigration, because it's easier to do that than to attack the people in power who have really kind of taken away this city from the locals, man. And I feel like that's what we're really talking about when we're talking about Boston. It's kind of in, it's investment towards kinds of discourses, like it's investment towards this kind of towny racism is all about its inability to address who's really got their fucking boot on their neck. It ain't a fucking bunch of people of color in this town. And I think that's why here it's particularly pernicious because the free for all is we'll take all your shit but we'll allow you to say anything you want about people of color. Some fucking swap, yo. <laughs> One day somebody's gonna wake up and be like, mm, nah, <laughs> nah, nah, we want our pie back. <laughs> Madam, come on, we are not allowed to talk about the Pulitzer Prize, the liberations, we're not, yeah? You've gotta remember that there are 17 people for those of you who are not caught up, the Pulitzer Prize did not give a fiction prize. And never in the history of the world had the fiction prize become so important. <laughs> For real. The context of this is hilarious. You would think that we declared no war for two years. This is a belligerent country addicted to war. You would think we took away its bone, you know? But the reality is, is that I am, I'm one, the only artist in the group 17 fucking votes. Anyone who knows anything about the way these rules work, you got to get a majority. Yeah. Um, and I'm not going to lie. Well, all I can tell you is that from what I know being inside of it, nobody was fucking happy that there wasn't a winner. Santa Claus does not like to go home with shit in his bag. <laughs> that there was some sort of... Con Be not confused. Santa wants to give presents out. And um, some of us, I would argue, the majority of us were very heartbroken about what happened. And again, the, you know, the, there's no silver lining. There's no any lining. The only dream I have is that we can elect two winners. You know, it doesn't help anyone in the year before. It's a heartbreak. You know, can you elect two winners? Yep. Will that fix things? Nope. Has suddenly people paid attention to fiction in ways? Yep. Does that compensate for what happened? Nope. What else? Come on, gang. You know, it's a good question. I wonder if it's like the best way to approach this is the meta way or the sort of like micro way, you know? As far as the micro way is concerned, it's pretty simple. I wake up early, I write early, I write before I speak, which is to say, as soon as I have a conversation, if I have to answer the phone, if anyone asks me anything that makes me have to make a decision, I'm immediately out of whatever I need to be in. I guess part of what I need to write, and most people don't need this, I need to sink deeply into this human space outside of all these other considerations. And as soon as I come up into the social space, the social space where you've got to answer questions, where you've got to sort of think about things, I'm out. I've broken the connection to whatever I need to connect with. So the other thing is, is I read enormously. I think that that's as much as my practice as any kind of writing. 
Yeah, when things are going good, which is about, and this is not a sarcastic little quip, when things are going good, which is about once every 10 years, I know because I've charted it, <laughs> then I will write day and night. But that's only happened once every 10 years. It's only happened twice in my entire career. Yeah. The macro level, uh, the, the sort of more meta level of this is, again, this is about more about my aesthetic than it is or more about my ethos as an artist than it is anything about useful things for you guys. Um, you know, part of what's weird about being an artist in this kind of place right now, especially if you're a writer, especially if you're a writer who's gotten any kind of attention, is that I can't write till that stuff fades. Yeah? So whatever is good for the quote unquote book is actually paradoxically bad for the artist, which is fine. No one is a victim here. You know, but it just means that for me, I have to wait usually a year after any book gets done for my brain to quiet down enough to write anything useful. Because until that year is over, I'm so in that kind of space of this kind of social space where I need to be sort of in an artistic space where it's less about any question of approval or any question of visibility and more about asking yourself very difficult things that you need to ask to make the art possible. So it's strange. I will write during the next year and all of it is just gonna be thrown away and all of it will just be leading me towards the moment when I finally go silent in my heart where other people are thinking about other things and I'm shaking off any desire that I might have for approval, for affirmation, whatever I, in my evil parts of my brain, connect to wanting people to like, like me, once that shit dies down, I begin my work. Right, no, it's a wonderful question about sort of, uh, it's, it's generally an American problem, but it's excruciatingly a writer of color problem, that in a literature we tend to have this aspirational transformative axis where it's not fun read unless our characters go from, you know, being Oliver Twist to being David Copperfield at the end of the book, you know, that it's a really important part of the, what we would call the American mythos for things to get better, for people to get better no matter, hopefully first they need to be tortured. <laughs> we like that. No, as a country, we love that shit. I want to read a story where somebody's like, my father abused me, but now I'm fucking ill. You know? <laughs> we love that shit. What we don't love is my father fucking abused me and I'm fucked up and ain't nothing much changed. I guess for me, it's because no matter how much success you get as a writer, there's really only three kind. there's really only kind of two kinds of writers. There's writers who sell in the millions and then the rest of us. I mean, guys, no matter what, you think I'm successful? Like, great, it's really, it's been a wonderful success. If I stopped teaching at MIT, I would start starving. <laughs> like, MIT is what keeps me fucking working, you know? And so I think a part of me also, because I'm so closely tied to a physical community, like a, a material community, it's hard for me to see the individual sort of narrative of improvement spread across a larger collective. And I, I think it's more honest that most of us, it's, it's, it's easy to write maybe or to think about winners, but the reality is most of us live lives where there is no clear determination between whether we have won or we have lost. All we can do at the end is hope we've put more love back into the world than we've taken out, but I guess even me, I, I know that there's, I have a part of me that's an artist, and there's a part of me that's a lived person. And as a lived person, I've made so many fucking mistakes. I've set myself back. I've done what all human beings do. You know, we kind of kick stuff over we shouldn't kick over. We hurt people we shouldn't hurt. We're cowards when we should have been brave. We're loud when we should have listened. We're fucking selfish when we should have been helpful. You know, all the things that make us human, it doesn't make us evil. And I guess a part of me, you know, I, you strive to be better, but you know that this is, the, the jury is always out when it comes to our humanity. Blessed is she who's confirmed that they are good for the rest of their life. I've never had that. I've never had that. I've always been like, and I don't think a, a increase in material conditions alleviates that. You know, I think that that's something we wrestle with.
And again, if you come from a family and your family's close, you're like, you have family members who are being deported. You have family members who are fucking broke as shit. You have family members making bad decisions and there's nothing you can do. I mean, sure, you can throw everything you got at it and there's still not enough. So I think part of me thinks about that in those terms, you know? And I've always hated those stories too. I always prefer the story where the person is like half burnt and Jane Eyre is like, I don't want to go out with you. <laughs> you know? I kind of like that shit. Even burning won't make up for your dickiness. <laughs> Was there a hand all the way in the back? I am definitely a Caribbeanist, so I have a ton of Caribbean folks. Um, you know, I'm a, a big fan of Ouija Dante Cat. I'm a big fan, yes, of Paulie Marshall. I'm a big fan of... Um, Patrick Chamoiseau, Alejo Carpentier. I'm a big fan of um, Pedro Mir. I'm a big fan of a Dominican poet, also essayist. His name is Frank Baez. I'm a big fan of a novelist turned out like big time indie fucking star, uh, Rita Indiana. Anybody know her early novels and her early stories were fantastic. Um, you know, but then there's an enormous amount of other people that I absolutely adore. I mean, I, I love Michael Martone. Most people haven't read Michael Martone. Michael Martone taught me how to write about states. I love the great American apocalyptics. You know, I love Cormac McCarthy and Toni Morrison. I mean, the two of them are obsessively American apocalyptics. They're every single thing that they've written about. Every book involves some horrifying apocalypse. And as a, someone who immigrated to this country, that always felt like this country's vernacular. Fuck like English and war and late modern capital. Those things we definitely speak well, but we speak apocalypse probably as well as any of them combined. And you know, there's a bunch of new people. I really love this Korean American writer. Her name is Chris Lee, who wrote uh, a group of stories called Drifting, um, uh, the Dr Drifting House. Thank you, <laughs> miho. Saved me. <laughs> Mio, thank you. You know, it's funny because we are really having kind of a renaissance in Korean, Korean American letters. If anybody's interested in reading, like in writing, Korean American writers are like breaking it up, man. Did somebody say something or they just went, yeah? <laughs> All right, let's get some sisters in here, man. Come on, man. How many artists again? Yeah? How many of you did not get support from your family? Yeah, it depends, right? It's sort of mixed. Some of us are blessed and our families think that's really cool because they've seen that there ain't no fucking formula. You could be a banker and shit doesn't work anyway. <laughs> it's true, you know? Shit doesn't work. You're like, I'm divorced, unhappy, and fucking fuck, and I'm old. Like, <laughs> you know? So, yeah, there's no formula, but some of us also come from families. If you come from an immigrant family, yeah, especially if you're like a Dominican, you're from one of these immigrant families that are super, super, we would call them practical. Yeah, Cap practical with like a capital P and an umlaut <laughs> and like italics, yo. <laughs> then the idea, especially my family, we were really, really poor. Um, my mother was raising five kids and in a few of us, my mother said, aha, uh -huh, this little Negro is smart. And this kid can be something concrete and something for real. And, you know, I think there's a sense that children can in immigrant families, you know. Children see their parents sacrifice their lives, and you feel like, I'm going to sacrifice my life for them too, which is really un-American in a way. And the American thing is parents go out and kill themselves so their kids can be dicks, <laughs> you know. And very true. I'm, I cannot wait to raise a couple dicks, guys. I'm telling you, because you know it is impossible to raise a kid with hustle. Once you, once you, once you get your shit together, your kid is a, a herb. So um, I think part of it was that my mom really had a very, she had a very deep sense that this was a kid who scores off the charts on any test they give them. Here's a kid who sort of had this kind of mind, and um, she wanted me to do something practical, being an artist, Dario, Alex, take care, bro. Um, the thing is, is that the, it just it seemed ridiculous to them. And think about it. This was in the 80s. This was Ronald Reagan. This was the height of Ronald Reagan's genocidal wars in Central America. People were coming into our neighborhood like super fucking traumatized, tortured, messed up. People were coming with 
the news was every single journalist was being murdered, assassinated. And my parents' background, writers and journalists were all being murdered, you know. And so my mom's idea that I would become a writer and that I wanted to write was just, she just thought that was crazy. And what happened with me was that um, in college, uh, I found a, there was a professor, she was from South Africa. And she'd been chased out of South Africa. Her husband had gotten his throat slit from ear to ear and left for dead because she was an anti-apartheid activist. They both were. And then he survived. And she was teaching creative writing in, um, she was teaching creative writing at Rutgers. And this was the woman who finally gave me the ability to imagine, because I was also trying to be a young activist. And she was like, listen, you know, this is your life. This is the only one you got. You know, your parents, I know you love them to death, but you got to take a gamble. You got to take a gamble. It's your only, it's your only, your only life, man. You know, and I'm listening to her and know that all the things that she went through and you know, she was, again, sort of amazing South African writer, South African activist. I just said, fuck, this is a person who makes a lot of sense to me. And I kind of took a gamble, and she was very supportive of me. Yeah. Some other questions. That's a wonderful question. It's probably going to be nearly impossible. I'll repeat it. Um, nearly impossible for me to give it the appropriate sort of consideration it requires. And the question, if I can sort of, again, I'll balderize it, and you'll help me, yeah? But the question was that the, my interlocutor pointed out that uh, the union in this book, and probably in my other books as well, uh, much of this kind of masculine identity which union participates in, this kind of Caribbean uh, diasporic identity, a lot of the men, their identities are constituted through their relationships with women. Is this okay so far? And then the second part was how do I see this play out not only as an artist, but in the larger sort of um, the larger tapestry of sort of Caribbean writing, but also perhaps other writing by writers of color. You mentioned Asian American writers and Indian American writers. Does that, is that a fair? Yeah, no, that's a wonderful question. I think that part of what's going on, at least I thought about, and again, I'm, I don't have the answer. It's to be part of what ends up happening is that you operate as an artist, often very unconsciously, you know? Now, I do a bunch of intellectual work. I'm not gonna pretend that this is some sort of like shamanistic primitive ritual. You know, which is far more advanced than the work I would do. Yeah, for real, like what we would call the primitive. It's like, you know, but I think despite the fact that I'm doing a lot of intellectual work and prep, there's also stuff that's unconscious. And, and also, I'm the least authoritative person to discuss my work. I mean, most of what I'm saying up here is just taking stabs at shit to be helpful. But the reality is, it's like, I don't know really what the fuck I'm talking about. I've written three fucking books, you know? Um, so... With that said, as caveats, I think for me what's interesting about and why I pursue Junior so relentlessly as a character is the way that this kind of Caribbean, African, diasporic, heteronormative masculinity gets understood. The way it gets articulated and the way it also gets expressed and the way it gets practiced and the failures of the people who are being sort of um, interpolated by it, the failures for them to live up to some of the expectations. And so I guess part of what's happening when I think about Junior is that I grew up in a universe where the sort of heteronormative kind of Dominican masculinity, a lot of it was predicated on, like, what was your relationship with women, man? For some dudes, it was just simply counting coup, you know, that you counted these many girls up. For some dudes, it was like keeping two or three girls in orbit. There was different approaches to it, but again, as you said, it was like all about sort of capturing certain kinds of women, time, space, imaginaries, yeah? And so I kind of was trying to pursue and think about it in that way. Again, I don't know how well I could answer the rest of the question because what I tend to find is I tend to find most masculinities that are being represented in literature tend to be very feeble and tend to be very inaccurate. And by feeble, I don't mean in the sense of strong, you know, or virile, but feeble is in a sense that they don't seem to in any way correlate to what I've experienced and seen. I think masculinity, because it's the site of enormous privilege, has obfuscatory powers, and people tend to be blinded by its kind of full, you know, it's kind of the dimensions, the different levels it operates on. Now, I'm not saying that I've, not been blinded by it, but I think for me the first step 
as a writer, was thinking that most of the men that I read in most literatures come out sounding like nothing like the dudes I grew up with or worked with. Yeah? They can get our crimes right, but they can't get much else right. <laughs> and I think that the crimes is not enough. Yeah? Because the intervention at the level of crime keeps the masculinity alive. It's sort of like the drug stuff. We keep going after drug dealers, but it doesn't deal with the root cause. Again, I'm not sure I've answered your question. Well, do you want to come back with something? Okay. Let me read a little bit to you, and then we'll take some more questions. I'm so sorry. Can I borrow your book, bro? <laughs> Thank you. So, let's just read... Um, I'm just going to read a story called, part of a story called The Sun, the Moon, and the Stars. A book, this book starts out, it's, this book I've written recently is kind of this weird little hybrid. Um, and in my mind, during the 16 years that I was writing it, I, every time I would work on it, I would write down at the head of the notebook, um, The Rise and Fall of a Cheater. That was what guided the entire work. I kept thinking, this is an important thing for me, and I really wanted to get at it. And so we open up with our cheater protagonist dumbass junior in full effect yeah we're basically at the height of his sort of privilege and his inability to understand what he's been up to so it's a story that begins with the opening lines like i'm not a bad guy yeah and junior has been caught cheating on his girl yeah and so we're just going to read a little bit we're going to bounce around a little bit in the story but if you could just follow me with it yeah so So he's been caught cheating with his girl, and the two of them, she's kind of given him a chance. You know, you guys ever catch someone cheating on you, and you make the ill mistake of giving him a chance? <laughs> Somebody here is like, no. <laughs> Good for you, man. Sometimes you got to have an ex-caliber heart, you guys. Yeah, I had an ex. She cut me off, and uh, I'm, like, really proud of the way she cut me off. I was like, that's the reason I dated you. For real. Nah, man. It's not that I don't believe in compassion, but I, I really did date her because she had, the, she had the strength of character that would be like, fuck you. <laughs> you know? So that's not bad. And forgiveness is good too. You know? But I just admired her for that. You know? So anyway, he gets caught. The two of them have this uh, trip to the Dominican Republic that they had planned together. And she's kind of given him a chance. And uh, you know the deal. If you're like fighting with somebody and your relationship's going down the tubes, the worst thing you could do is grab your fucking passport, yeah? <laughs> somebody do it? You do it? I, I've done it. You've done it, huh? Yeah, anybody? A mess, right? You're fucking lucky to live, to, to live another day, right? So anyway, they, he finally cons her. Her name um, is Magda into coming on this trip. So we join them as they land. Yeah? And the story is called The Sun, the Moon, the Stars. Let me confess. I love Santo Domingo. I love, com I love coming home to the guys in the blazers trying to push little cups of brugal into my hands. I love the plane landing, everybody clapping when the wheels kiss the runway. I love the fact that I'm the only nigger on board without a Cuban link or a flapjack of makeup on my face. I love the redhead woman on her way to meet the daughter she hasn't seen in 11 years. The gifts she holds on her laps like the bones of a saint. Mi hija has tetas now, the woman whispers. <laughs> the last time I saw her, she could not even speak. Now she's a woman. Imaginate. I love the bags my mother packs. Shit for relatives and something for Magda. A gift. You give this to her no matter what happens. If this was another kind of story, I would tell you about the sea, what it looks like after it's been forced into the sky through a blowhole, how when I see it, how when I'm driving in from the airport and see it like this, like shredded silver, I know I'm back for real. And I would tell you about how many poor motherfuckers there are, more albinos, more cross-eyed niggers, more tigres than you'll ever see. 
And I'd tell you about the traffic, the entire history of late, century, late 20th century automobiles swarming across every flat stretch of ground, a cosmology of battered cars, battered motorcycles, battered trucks, and battered buses, and an equal number of repair shops run by any fool with a wrench. And I'd tell you about the shanties and our no running water faucets and the sambos on the billboards and the fact that my family home comes equipped with the ever reliable latrine. And I'd tell you about my abuelo and his campo hands and how unhappy he is that I am not sticking around. And I would tell you about the street where I was born, Calle 21, how it hasn't decided yet if it wants to be a slum or not, and how it's been in this state of indecision for years. But that would make this another kind of story, and I am having enough trouble with this one as it is. <laughs> You'll have to take my word for it. Santo Domingo is Santo Domingo. Let's pretend we all know what goes on there. All right. So they, they, they get there. All right. And um, again, this is... Dominican shit, probably other island people know this stuff too, and maybe other people, but straight up Dominican shit. Again, if you're kind of like a little Dominican hipster, yeah, the worst fucking place you want to go to is a resort. <laughs> Motherfuckers are always like, yo quiero taco mi gente. <laughs> right? So, you know, unless you're ducking on your family, because some of us got crazy family, and then we like sneak away to resort, you know? So the split in this is that Junior, he's like, oh, we're going to drive around Santo Domingo, get the real country. And Magda's like, I want to go to a fucking resort, all exclusive with massages and fucking chill. So she wins, yeah? And this is where we at. By the middle of day three, of our all Kiskeya redemption tour, we were in an air-conditioned bungalow watching HBO, exactly where I want to be when I'm in Santo Domingo in a fucking resort. Magda's reading a book by a trappist in a better mood, I guess, and I was sitting by the edge of the bed fingering my useless map. And I was thinking, for this, I deserve something nice. Something physical, yeah? Me and Magda were usually pretty damn casual about the sex, but ever since our breakup, shit had gotten weird. First of all, it wasn't as regular like before. I'm lucky to score some once a week, and I have to nudge her to start things up, or we won't fuck at all. And she plays like she doesn't want it, and sometimes she doesn't, and then I gotta cool it. But other times, she does want it, and then I have to touch her pussy, which is my way of saying, my way of initiating things, of saying, so how about we kick it, mommy? <laughs> and she'll turn her head, which is her way of saying, I am too proud to acquiesce openly to your animal desires. <laughs> but if you continue to put your finger in me, I won't stop you. Today, we started no problem, but then halfway through, she said, wait, we shouldn't. I wanted to know why. <laughs> she closed her eyes like she was embarrassed at herself. Forget about it, she said, her hips moving under me. Just forget about it. And so, we see things are not going well. And we join them on the beach, and this will be it. Once you see sand on somebody's ass, wake up and clap. <laughs> yeah? All right. <laughs> we wake up bright and early. Ah, well, we might as well go. I don't even want to tell you where we're at. We're in Casa de Campo, the resort that shame forgot. The average asshole would love this place. It's the largest, wealthiest resort on the island, which means it's a goddamn fortress walled away from everybody else. With guachimanes and peacocks and ambitious topiaries everywhere. 
advertises itself in the states as its own country, and it might as well be. It has its own airport, 36 halls of golf, and beaches so white they ache to be trampled, and the only island Dominicans that you'll see are guaranteed to either be caked up with money or changing your sheets. Let's just say that my abuelo has never been here, and neither has yours. You chill here too long, you'll have your ghetto pass revoked, no questions asked. <laughs> Me and Magda wake up bright and early for the buffet. Magda is scratching out a couple of cards to her family. I want to talk about the day before, but when I bring it up, she puts down her pen, jams on her shades. I feel like you're pressuring me, she says. How am I pressuring you, I say. I just want some space to myself every now and then. Every time I'm with you, I have this sense that you want something from me. Time to yourself, I say. What does that mean? Like maybe once a day, you do one thing and I do another. Like when, I say. Like now? It doesn't have to be now. She looks exasperated. Why don't we just go down to the beach? As we walk over to the courtesy golf cart, I say, I feel like you rejected my whole country, Magda. Don't be ridiculous. I just want to relax. What's wrong with that? The sun is blazing, and the blue of the ocean is an overload on the brain. Casa de Campo has got beaches the way the rest of the island has got problems. These, though, have no merengue, no little kids, nobody trying to sell you chicharrones, and there is a massive, a massive melanin deficit in evidence. <laughs> Every 50 feet, there's at least one Euro fuck beached out on a towel like some scary pale monster that the sea has vomited up. <laughs> they look like philosophy professors, like budget Foucaults, and too many of them are in the company of dark-ass Dominican girls. I mean it, these girls can be no older than 14, look puro and genio to me. And you can tell by their inability to communicate that these two did not meet back in their left bank days. Magda is rocking an Ochun colored bikini that her girls helped her pick out so she could torture me, and I am in these old ruined trunks that say Sandy Hook forever. <laughs> I'll admit it, with Magda half naked in public, I'm feeling vulnerable and uneasy. I put my hand on my knee, on her knee, I say, I just wish you'd say you love me. Junior, please. Can you say you like me a lot? Can you leave me alone? You are such a pestilence. We'll leave it there. Thank you. Thank you. So, gang, we got 15 and we're done. So let's just get a few more questions here. Yeah, this corner right there. Yeah, how do you find the intersection between sort of writing as kind of a, a person of color, in this case, kind of a Dominican kid um, who, I, when I'm ever I'm on Harvard, everybody thinks I'm like Gujarati, you know? <laughs> For real, but I'm actually of African descent, yeah. Uh, and how do I find the intersection there? Is there somebody, a Gujarat here who's clapping? <laughs> That's awesome. Yes, I'm always being addressed, man. And my students are like, professor, nobody thinks I'm Dominican. Fuck. <laughs> yeah. Our people have like the most simplistic formulas, you know? And so, and how do I do that and combine it with nerd culture? Well, it wasn't easy. My first book, Drown, I had to teach myself, first of all, how do I write about Jersey Dominican people who think of themselves as absolutely normal? They don't think of themselves <laughs> as, they don't think of themselves as uh, subjects in a Henry Louis Gates uh, documentary about <laughs> blacks and Latinos, you know? For real, it's like, how do I write in fiction what the Los Brothers Hernandez are doing in Love and Rockets? And so I had to do that in that first book. It was only when I started writing Oscar Wilde that I pushed myself to think about the way that I could write about nerdness in a way that made fit, that fit both my narrator protagonist and fit the reality. What was super useful was that most of the, what we would call the important central tropes of science fiction and fantasy are either come out of a colonial experience, come out of modernity, and come out with certain preoccupations about the other that is in many ways has its root in that initial first contact 
nightmare genocide zone called the Caribbean. And so therefore, the idea of people with superpowers, yeah, I mean, think about it. The Spaniards couldn't stop writing about how when they met the Indians, they felt like they had superpowers. You know, like, oh, the Indians would say it would take 500 of them to kill one of us. Yeah, the ideas that are in many science fiction books about breeding people. Well, <laughs> you don't need science fiction. You just need a bunch of white people in the 14th century saying, fuck, let's breed these Negroes. You know, and I think it goes on and on and on. I felt that there was a lot of really interesting parallels that a lot of the tropes in science fiction and the genres were really kind of resonating with a lot of the historical work. And so I just kind of went in, you know. I went in and I just took a shot at it. And I can't say that at first I knew what the fuck I was doing. I mean, the fact that it worked at all in Oscar Wilde, if it worked at all, was just experimentation. And I think your character, in some ways, in the end, you only have to convince a small group of people. Because I've had, I've actually literally, it's crazy how different people want to, like, they confuse your art for you, you know? How I've had actually people raise their hands and try to, like, nerd interrogate me. <laughs> They're like, as if anybody would be, like, desperate to pass for a nerd. It's like, it really, it's like forging a Dominican passport, for real. If you're gonna fucking forge, forge big, you know? So I guess, yeah, I guess it's a lot of it comes from experimentation. It, it's a matter of titration, especially if you're working in this area. I know it sounds stupid, but it's a matter of titration. You put a little in, see how much it can hold, you take some out till you find that sweet spot. And I spent years trying to find the sweet spot. What's best about a published book is whatever is useful in that grammar, other people can take and modify. I mean, if Oscar is useful for anything as a novel, it's like a basic toolkit, you know? It doesn't mean anyone will use it, but if someone wants to, they can, and make it far better than it is. And there's other writers doing that, too, that are basic toolkits. I didn't have any when I was writing. I mean, I had people I loved of color who were working in the genres, but not that they were doing this kind of blend, like uh, Samuel R. Delaney and Octavia Butler and stuff like that. Yeah, I mean, I can't live without Samuel Delaney and Octavia Butler. Samuel R. Delaney and Octavia Butler. Well, part of this is because it was part of the project. Oscar Wilde's project was about dictatorship. And dictatorship, any question of dictatorship has to have somewhere in there, which narratives do we give authority to? Because, you know, dictatorship can't work unless we give authority to it. Yeah? I mean, really, it's part of it. And so, what I was interested in Oscar Wilde was how far could I push the reader to give authority to a narrator that they'd never met? And I think it's fascinating. We will follow narratives that we don't know where they came from, but we follow them like we had made them ourselves. We have possessive relationships to received narratives, which are very, very dangerous for us. And people have taken advantage of this historically. And dictatorships take advantage of that. I think that we as readers and we as sort of social actors are often like have a great penchant for just handing out authority. And I think that was what was happening in Oscar Wilde. I kind of just was playing with that. Thank you. So the questions final that we're wrapping up with is um, in Drown, I wrote uh, about a character named Aurora. And um, if I could talk a little bit about her. Yeah, is that helpful? Yeah, Aurora, again, um, it's a lot of times I'm too kind of, too elliptical for my own good. And one of the things that was happening was that I was kind of writing about what it meant to come up as a teenager right in the middle of what they call the crack epidemic. You know, again, these days it's like for young people, it's unimaginable what the hell was going on. But for those who kind of grew up on the front lines of it, man, it was out of fucking control. It's almost impossible to describe how insane yeah, the full blown out late 80s crack madness when you combined it with AIDS, what it was doing to certain communities and specifically the community I was growing up in. Yeah. And so I think that part of what was happening when I was writing Aurora was that there was a young gal. She was my neighbor. If you lived in the apartments that we grew up in, the apartments like the walls were there to enhance. 
sound. They were like really interesting diaphragms. They just, and she was a neighbor. And um, you know, I, it's so funny. She was like my age and she got caught up in it. She just like, she just got caught up in it, man. She was like the same grade as I was. We were going to school together. And I followed her life as I was charting my life through that wall. Yeah, I mean, like, it was really crazy. Like, I, I feel like I knew her life better than I knew anyone else's life. And part of it was because, you know, you're a young kid, you have a crush. Part of it is you hope to God that somebody like that can just pull out, you know, because you're, I thought I was never fucking going to get out. I thought somebody was going to stab me before I was like, not because I was some hood, but because this is what happened. I was convinced I was fucking done for, so I was kind of praying for her because I didn't have much prayers for me at that time, you know? And, um... And I felt like I wanted to kind of bear witness to that. And she was, you know, the Aurora in many ways is, uh, depends on her as a character and it depends on that moment. You know, and of course my brother, my older brother was caught up in that whole thing with her too. And so it was all about that, yeah. Again, we all have our spaces. There's no person, you know, who doesn't go through a part of their life when they're just like can't believe that they got through it, you know? And those of you who do, have parents or some fortune that lets you not have to go through that and uh, I think that story was an attempt to mark that because I found myself when I got to college doing everything possible not to remember as soon as I got a meal plan I stopped thinking about missing meals yeah as soon as I could study poverty as an abstraction I stopped thinking about sharing three shirts with my brother through high school you know it's amazing how we will avoid things. Yeah, I always know a real poor person because it costs them to mention it that they're poor. You know? And uh, I think this was an attempt for me to write something. So I don't know if you ever saw that movie Inception. You should see Inception. It's not awesome, awesome, but it's fun, fun. And uh, <laughs> in Inception, the way that they kind of remind themselves that they're awake and not dreaming as they do create these little totems. You gotta see the movie. And I felt that I wrote Aurora as my totem so that I would always know that to keep myself from falling into a dream, to keep myself awake, that this stuff did happen, you know? And in my rush to forget and to ignore the pain and to sort of put it behind me, which is not good. The pain doesn't go away just because you forget. For young writers now, the second question and the final question was, advice for young writers. Again, the difficulty of being an artist in a culture like ours is uh, multiple. First things first, and we'll leave it with just a couple points. First things first, being a young artist, they have professionalized the arts the way that they have professionalized the universities. These have just become guild spots where you get a stamp so you can go on and get a job. Fuck getting a liberal arts education. They're like, this is your little passport so you can get a white collar job is what they're trying to turn most of universities into. And the arts have been deeply professionalized. Most of my students who want to pursue the arts want to pursue the arts the way they would pursue accounting. No, for real. It is a replacement for a profession. They don't have an ethic of art in it. And part of what makes a young artist interesting is that they are countercultural is that they're not trying to professionalize their practice, is that they know that the only thing that makes art matter is that you, the artist, brings us news of the world. Whether you're dancing or making sculpture or doing video work, it is the news of the world that you have lived and that you have that is powering your art. What happens with the professionalization is that they teach you that you should graduate from college and you should immediately go to an MFA program or go do something programmatic that you should avoid life. Anything that has to do outside of the university is life. And you should avoid it. And I have so many students who come to my office hours and they're like, professor, no, I don't want to work for a year or two. How can you get me right into an arts program? And this is what's ended up happening. We have a lot of bad Jedis out there doing art. <laughs> they're not bad people. They're not bad people, but they confuse being an artist for a new profession, yeah? And I think that you can do that, and many people do that, but the weeks, the books are febrile. The art is febrile. And I think that if you wanna be an artist who will matter to anyone after your career is done, 
you need to go and encounter the world as fully as possible. So I always tell people, if you want to be a young artist, you got to do exactly the thing that scares most parents the most and most college kids the most, which is you got to go out into life and be surrounded by people who don't give a fuck about you. <laughs> because that's who your real audience is and that's what your work is going to be. You're throwing your work into a world where nobody cares you. The best advice I was ever given by my art teacher, the South African woman, was Juno, go get your heart broken in three continents and then write. <laughs> and that's what I did. <laughs> Is that the only answer? No, because you have brilliant, you have brilliant writers who go from college to, uh, to MFA program to whatever. They never leave the nursering teat of an institution, the, you know, the nurturing teat of an institution. There's a million ways to be an artist, but I think the one that this society which is trying to turn everybody into a fucking machine and trying to turn everybody into a professional. What this society needs more of are these wild young women who are out there in the world, get some news, see some shit, come back and fucking deliver the art that lives outside of these professional restraints and these professional sort of attitudes. And I think that that would be most useful. And if you're a writer, you better be reading a book a week. Guys, you're very kind, thank you. Thank you.